Front from New York City, and we're real happy to be home. P Dog in the house. Come on, motherfucking team here, team.
walls up into a wall. Good shout.
This is true to the fucking game. Keep on the face, I choke, got no place to go. 
Professional, you get the music just right because this music is so delicate and so we want to be in tune. We don't want to come off like a bunch of drunken fat punk rockers. That will work. Why? Yeah, that's right. We want to just make everything just right. So, Tom, pig champions. Ah. Music to our ears. Don't look back, what I'm wearing 
Go! Uh -huh. 
Fucking Cleveland. Fucking piss it.
Who's looking at my fucking set list? I don't want to be a fucking victim!
Vibrators, this is our 25th anniversary tour. All right. It's very sad about Joey Ramon. I'm sorry about that. It's nothing to do with me, but that's one of those things. This is for Joey. Yes, for Joey. Loud and fast. Oh. So 
to remain silent. 
All right. We do, we do a couple old ones, and then uh, one more, and we're over. This one, you know, alcohol. You can sing it. Too. You guys, you guys are great. How do you remember those lyrics? Nice. You motherfuckers rock. Well, it only took 20 years. This next song was the first song that, when I met Doug, that he showed me, and it was called uh, Kill for Cash. <laughs>
Thank you very much. I really didn't remember that one at all. I just kind of made that up. You were faking? Yeah, I was. I had to call that one uh, Reflections on Suburbia. It's a little thing I wrote myself. We used to think this next song was funny. Now it just pisses us off. Why is that? Because it's called Old People Talk Loud.
Hello, my name is Hilly Crystal, and I started CBGB's way back in December of 73. Seems that I've had this place forever. <laughs> Good part of my life, anyway. And it's on the Bowery, as you know. And the Bowery used to be a place for lost souls, people who uh, had nowhere to go. They're on alcohol, on on whatever. They were lost in life. And they had flop houses and everything else. Bars were called like the Last Mile or the Confidence Bar, Blue Moon Cafe. They probably had about 30, 40 bars, and these were for maybe more for derelicts. They also had um, flop houses. Flop houses were, well, when I was, when I started this place, we were under the largest flop house on the Bowery. But they were like a dollar a night for a bed. Before that, years ago, they were two bits, one quarter. And uh, I'm going to take you to the front of the club. And it's kind of like it was in uh, December 73, but not quite because it has more handbills, more graffiti, more everything. We're not going outside because right outside... Um, they have a scaffolding. So for the next six to eight months, nobody will see. You can see the canopy, but we can't uh, really see the front of the place. So we'll have to do with just doing the inside. We'll go right to the front door now. Now the front door... I guess, I don't know, a million people, two million people have come in through the years. But I know we've had about 40 or 50,000 sets played here. We have 75 to 80 bands a week. Some of them repeat. Some have repeated very often. Of course, people were familiar with the early 70s, the Ramones started here and played over and over and over. Blondie, uh, Talking Heads, Patti Smith, Television, the Shirts, Mink Deville, many, many bands that uh, started in this pretty bad era, 74, 75. It was a recession, bad recession. Bad in the sense that nobody had any money, but you didn't really need much at that point. So that's when we started this uh, punk club, except we didn't use the word punk because nobody used the word punk for this. It wasn't discovered yet. And I didn't discover it. It kind of discovered me. And just showing you the inside, we're going to go down towards the bar. This is an old bar that actually, uh, where you see it now, this is where... Uh, <laughs> Sid Vicious and uh, Cheetah Chrome uh, got into an argument, and uh, Sid Vicious first threw a uh, mug at the mirror, and I think Cheetah said, what are you doing that for? And he said something nasty and threw one at him. And I came up and I threw him out. I threw Sid Vicious out. That's... Uh, that was the first time I threw him out. I threw him out again. He's, Vicious was a good name for him. He uh, felt he was somebody important, but he was not very nice to people, including other musicians. So this bar, uh, the whole bar is about 75 feet long, and some parts of it date back to before 1900, and... Uh, some were put in about 1920-something, and some, uh, uh, the middle part, I think, uh, is from the 1940s, from what I understand. And the back bar was always there. Actually, if we can go down to this front end, uh, can we go behind the bar? Can you take that behind the bar in this front end here? 
with a picture behind the bar on the wall, you can't get to that. You can't get to it, you know. Actually, we had an artist draw some of the pictures of the derelicts that were on the wall. They, she, she drew them on the wall, or, or painted them, rather. And these, this is what it was when I first came in. They had these guys would line up at 8 in the morning, about 20, 30 of them, and stagger in for their four, first uh, white port muscatel. And that was the... Uh, that was the scene here <laughs> as I was fixing it up. I guess the place doesn't look fixed up, but we put this uh, roof, you can see the, the roof on this thing because it looked pretty, now it looks kind of funky before it looked ugly. <laughs> and uh, the beer signs lit the, uh, and still do, they light the, the uh, whole walkway all the way down till about uh, 75 feet from the stage. And that's uh, what, let's see. All right. Now, can we get a view of the uh, BBGB stage? And it's famous basically because of the uh, people who played here. Uh, it used to be about two layers, and I think one year uh, we had uh, the Booyah tribe, yeah, they each weigh 400 pounds or so. So we put two more layers on it so it wouldn't cave in. But, uh, <laughs> so it grew two and a half inches, or one and a half inches. But this is it. This is the stage. On the, uh, on the wall we had Initially, I think you can see in a lot of old pictures uh, uh, things that I put up from place I had before. They're old posters. And here we really have, I think, the most important part of the physical club, which are the, the sound system, the speakers. You know, uh, speakers. Uh, we made specially for this, and uh, it took me about 15 years to pay off the speakers and the sound system and the recording equipment uh, with interest. <laughs> but we literally had the best, best sound system in the city for rock and roll. It was by far the best. And that's not only what I say, it's what all the record companies say. That's why they like to put in bands through the years. But that wasn't always the case. When I opened, uh, on this side, right where you see the exit sign, this is where we had the stage. It was up here, and if you see a picture of the, uh, if you see a picture of the uh, stage on the um, double album that we put out in 77, we recorded it. Well, at least we took the pictures on that stage. So that was 76, actually. 76, 75, 74. And in a, later on, I'll take you to the gallery because the gallery's next door, and I got that about 15, 16, 17 years ago. And the gallery still has... I put a stage in right where I had the stage back in 74, 5, and 6. But this big stage, which is pretty big for a 350, 400-foot um, club, this has been uh, a joy for uh, a lot of musicians. They've, uh, and now since so many people from Tom Petty, uh, Let's see, ACDC, I, I don't know, through the years we've had so many bands did Iggy Pop, did played here, uh, John Cale, uh, uh, I can't, I can't think of everybody. Uh, those were from older, some of them older bands, but through the years I've mentioned before some of the others. Punk was named Punk, I think, back in 76. And in 76, um, Punk Magazine, I think they take the credit, 
but I don't know if they really did start using the name, but a lot of other writers did too. And uh, so this became a punk scene. Before that, we called it street rock. You know, Richard Hell, Richard Hell and the Voidoids, he used to be in television and with uh, Johnny Thunders. Well, he, on his t shirt tour, he used a safety pin. And they used to pick up these secondhand t shirts left over from the 60s. And they were like uh, two or three for a dollar. Jeans were a dollar a piece. So, as I say, it wasn't too bad uh, a deal, uh, even though nobody had much money. You didn't need much. And uh, that's how it was. Um, the bands through the years went from not only punk, I mean, I don't know, Talking Heads are kind of punky, but uh, then, but not really, but some of the others were. And uh, then, of course, we had bands like uh, the Dead Boys and uh, Pierre Ubu from, from Cleveland. We had bands from Philadelphia. The Cars played from Boston plus many other bands from all these cities. A lot of bands from Minneapolis, from uh, Detroit, Atlanta. Uh, eventually, uh, people from South America started to come in. And then, uh, discovering all this, uh, were writers, rock writers from Europe, uh, UK, a lot of people from Japan. Lots and lots and lots of people from Japan have always been here, I think. Uh, young people there were, were always interested in new things and uh, they really took to uh, punk music. But back in the uh, 80s, as it went into the... Of course, we had, uh, uh, before that, we had bands like um, B-52s and it started a whole new wave scene with that. But then Sonic Youth started, Swans... All these bands played here, most of these played here, not one or two or three, but 30, 40, 50 times. Not all of them, but some of them. Uh, they didn't have any place to play back in the 70s, except Max's opened a little after I did. They reopened, and we were kind of friendly competitors, Max's Kansas City, and uh, Tommy Dean had just bought it from Mickey... And uh, he, was a, he was a good guy, and we developed a scene. When you have two places about 15, 20 blocks apart, it developed a really good scene in New York. It was healthy. And then there was always another club opening or closing or opening or closing. You had one in Queens. The Mud Club opened for a few years. Hurrah's way uptown. Yeah, there are all kinds of clubs. At one point in the 80s, we had about, I think, about 30... 30 or so, 30 rock clubs. This is for new rock. And before I came, nobody allowed new rock. They just wouldn't let anybody play your own music. And I figured, since I was a musician, and I was, I wrote my own music, and I just felt what I liked, what I really liked, was to hear people do their own thing, write their own thing play their own music. And I felt this was what I thought was special about music. I mean, they can learn to play well if they practice, but the ones that really shone from writing their own music and playing their own music are, I felt were exceptional. And uh, I don't think a lot of places, most places, allowed anybody to do more than one or two songs of their own unless they had a record out. Of course, we call it CDs now, then they call them records. Uh, it's not old enough to say they were 78s, though I, I don't know. No, they were all only LPs then. <laughs> so, now, of course, you're watching on a DVD or a VHS, so things are, my God, they're really moving along, moving along. And, um, I'll come to the center. You know, all these walls, I think we can pick them up. Uh, they just get plastered and replastered with uh, handbills. Uh, oh, I forgot to say, I don't think we can get anything past the stage, but past the stage on your 
facing the stage on the left hand side is uh, the bathrooms. They're infamous. I don't know all that happened down there, but you had to go downstairs to go to the bathrooms and uh, people who come in here, it's, it's like they're rock enthusiasts. They always want to see the bathrooms. I don't know what they've heard, but they probably know more than I do. And, uh, and there's graffiti on the walls all over. Graffiti, handbills, posters, some torn off, some kept on. Probably there are quite a few layers in some places. Uh, I'm coming towards the uh, the uh, soundboard, which is a sound craft, and the first one, first uh, sound system I had was a sound craft when we got this wonderful sound system in the latter part of 76, 77. And now we have, my gosh, look at all we have. We have every bit of equipment, the speakers, the board, all the toys that engineers need. And, uh, and of course we have cameras now so we can do live streaming. And you're watching it on the uh, cameras that we use uh, for the live streaming. Luke is our engineer today. And uh, in fact, he helped put in this, this uh, video system too. The groups are really interesting. The variety of groups. You know, we, we had groups that they called punk. Some were more punky than others. Some were more pop punk. And some were just pop music. We, we really had all kinds of music. In the early 80s, late 70s, is when hardcore started here. And we had bands from Washington, D.C. come up. We had uh, hardcore bands from Boston. And uh, I think Agnostic Front was one of the first bands, uh, um, which you'll see today. They started in 81, 82. Uh, some of the bands through the, through the early years in uh, hardcore were Murphy's Law, Agnostic Front, Minor Threat, uh, other bands from Washington, Government Issue, um, Boston, I don't know. There were so many bands, I can't even remember them all. But a lot of good ones, a lot of, a lot of great bands. White Zombie was not hardcore. I don't know what, what you'd say they were doing then. Of course, now, Mr. Zombie, I uh, hope he's not a zombie, is, uh, he's doing his own thing without the whole group. Uh, we had started getting a lot of bands from Chicago, like Scratch Acid, Big Black. Oh yeah, Bad Brains, Bad Brains. They were, they were a phenomenal group from Washington, D.C. They came up with Minor Threat. Uh, they were the first all-black rock group, and uh, through the years they've been a wonderful group. And I still see some of them, though they're not together at this point. Uh, I think we have some recordings of them someplace around, but um, great guys. But alas, people don't stay together, do they? Not except the Stones, they always keep getting together. <laughs> um, let's see, where are we? Uh, bands like Sonic Youth who played initially to nobody, stuck to their guns. Nobody liked them at first, and they just kept playing and playing and playing. And I know Homestead Records put them out, and then another band on the West Coast, another uh, record label. And finally, people saw, they heard what they were doing. They understood it. They loved it. And uh, I, I think... Uh, they're one of my favorite bands in the sense also that they really help a lot of other bands. The Ramones, another, uh, Joey was uh, 
wonderful with other bands. In his later years, uh, he helped a lot. Um, Chris and Tina of the Talking Heads, uh, David Byrne separately started his own label. Uh, Patti Smith is always, of course, she retired for a few years and then she came back again, but she was marvelous. Back in 74, she, or 75, it was 75, she played here and uh, with Lenny Kay and Ivan Crowell. And it was, uh, she played here seven weeks in a row and was signed out of here by uh, uh, Arista. Uh, later on, television was signed. Blondie was signed uh, to private stock. Originally, uh, Richard Goddard was the producer. And uh, first, everybody turned Blondie down. But uh, they didn't listen. They didn't listen. She was writing wonderful lyrics, her own lyrics that you know you knew that were very personal. And um, Chris, her boyfriend and the guitarist, was writing the music. And then Jimmy Destry was writing music. And Clem was the drummer. I mean, they were it was developed in quite a band. And of course, uh, Blondie, back in, I'd say, from 78, 79 on, became maybe the most popular of this kind of band in the world. Maybe the most popular band in the world. I think uh, Blondie was on more covers in Europe than, uh, than Madonna ever was. Uh, and she's still doing things. Debbie and, and Chris, the whole band, is together again, which is great. Of the new bands, we have a lot of new bands, and some you're going to hear uh, on this uh, DVD. Some you'll hear on this VHS. Uh, either way, it'll be the same thing. <laughs> so uh, we hope you enjoy it. And uh, you should actually come to our site at cbgb.com and you can see some of the history that I've talked about, but a little bit more depth uh, up through 77 and maybe at this point I'll have gone to 78 or 9. Uh, you can see we have lots of t-shirts you can get online. You can see the gallery, some of the artists. You know, there are a lot of artists that were musicians, a lot of musicians who were artists. I mean, fine artists. They painted, they were photographers. It was a big mixture of uh, talent. So this is what CBGB was and is, and um, I say again, I, I hope you uh, enjoy watching and listening to these live performances. Now these are live performances, not uh, no editing and it's just the way you hear it and see it. Of course we wish we could have a huge screen but I think to really get the essence of what's happening you gotta, you gotta come here. But uh, this is the next best, best thing, hearing, hearing all this music live so I hope you like it. This is a punk hardcore album and it's the first uh, compilation that we are putting out and I think we're going to have many many more of different kinds I'm standing in CB's gallery which is right next door to CBGB club and I came over here not really to introduce the gallery but to show you a few things that were at the club back in 74 and 5. Now, the stage on this side was where the, everybody was until 77, the latter, part of, the latter part of 76. So this was pretty much like the stage was. It's a little much smaller than the stage at the club, but that's how the stage was in 74. 75, 76, 
and all the bands played there. And we had a, well, the last year we had a pretty good sound system. And um, over there is uh, where the bathrooms were, not downstairs as they are now and have been since 77. And there were just two stalls and you close the door and do whatever you do. And speaking of that, uh, I remember one time my former wife, who used to hang out here, <coughs> unfortunately, uh, opened one of the doors, and who should be there but uh, Debbie Harry and Chris Stein. Making love, making love. But they lived together, but I guess they couldn't wait to get home, so I guess in between sets, uh, that's how it was. And on this side, in this area, at the club, this was at the club, uh, where that bench, long bench is, we had a pool table. And the New York Dolls never played, really played, individually they did, but they never played as New York Dolls at CBGB's, but they played pool, it would have been right in this spot, the stage over here, bathrooms there, and they played pool over there. And every time they came off tour, they came in, hung out, and played pool. So I'll take you, if you can uh, show a little bit of the uh, gallery now, which is uh, more acoustic. We have some great, great music here, but it's, uh, and at some point throughout the next year, uh, we'll be having a compilation from the gallery. But uh, if you ever come to the site, cbgb.com, you'll be able to log on to the gallery and see a lot of the past uh, art shows. A lot of these artists are musicians. And uh, some are better at one thing uh, than the other. Uh, but Quite a few of them are. Uh, you know, it started way back when Bowie, not here, but Bowie, we used to hang out next door at the, at the club. He was an artist. David Byrne, Chris and Tina, the Talking Heads uh, were artists. And, uh, oh, we had so many. The Revlons, uh, Ray Beats, different, uh, probably maybe even one quarter of the bands that ever played here, somebody was connected with art. They were fine artists. And just last night, a band that's played here recently, uh, the Chicklets. Though we're not going to be on this compilation, we didn't get them. But uh, with Jackie and Sarah, now Sarah is an artist. She plays the drums, guitar. Jackie sings, plays bass. And Cindy uh, plays guitar, lead guitar. Real good punk band. And one of them's an artist. Very good artist, too. So I just feel that uh, art, fine art, or photo art, or sculpture, and rock music, they have an affinity with each other. And uh, same people seem to, a lot of them say, like the same things. And uh, of course, a lot of people have dual talents, or more than dual, triple. So uh, can you focus on uh, fish? This is our cat. He's. He's the real owner. Fish. Hi. That's a good look. Watch out for mice. They'll eat you up. <laughs> okay. That's all. Yeah.